Hello and welcome to this introduction of Vikings Return to China. As of September 2024, we will start sailing along the Chinese coast and we want you to travel with us. And I will start with the very first itinerary, the wonders of China. It's also our longest. It's 20 days. It has 14 guided tours and it all takes place in that one country, China. And we do this voyage with this beauty here. You may recognize it as the Viking Sun. The ship is now called the Viking Yudun and it takes you from Shanghai to Shenzhen or vice versa. This particular picture was taken in front of the skyline of Shenzhen, one of China's most miraculous new cities. Next slide shows you with the tiny little panda bear in the tree, where we take you on the wonders of China. You arrive in Beijing and then we have two days there. So day one is arrival, day two and three are the days where you get to see the Forbidden City, the Great Wall. You then travel to Shanghai, embark the ship. Uh, we will have some time in Shanghai. Uh, then you will travel from Shanghai through the East China Sea to what shows on. And Dongtao, Pingtang and Xiamen follow in the next days. We then spend a day at sea for you to take a little bit of a break from all the activities on shore. And then we arrive in Shenzhen. That is the terminus of the cruise. And from that point on, we travel by land uh, to Chengdu, which is where the Panda base is. After Chengdu, we take you to Lhasa. We spend two and a half days in Tibet before taking you to Xi'an. And Xi'an is where the terracotta warriors are. From Xi'an, there is a final night in Beijing, and then you return home. And this is what it looks like on a map. So top right there is Beijing. You fly to, uh, to Shanghai. You spend your time on the coastal voyage. Uh, you disembark in Shenzhen, fly to Chengdu, then on to Lhasa in Tibet, back to uh, the Terracotta Wars in Xi'an, and you are from Beijing returning home. Okay, let's um, talk a little bit about how we travel with Viking. And this is something that you're probably familiar with if you've ever traveled with us before. Um, we like to call it the Viking way. We go beyond what you think of as iconic and expect it, and we bring you local life. Um, I mentioned earlier that you will break bread with a Tibetan family. You will also, and this has been one of my personal favorite of, of any journey that we've done in the past to China, is we've introduced um, our guests to uh, Chinese school children. And these school children they learn English and um, they, among other things, learn English so they can practice it with our visitors. Um, the working world is very important to us. We try to focus on um, what do people do for a living? Um, what does their day look like? And in Zhouzhan, we can bring you to uh, a fishing boat it's, it's one of the largest fisheries in the world. And, um, you know, what does the daily life of a fisherman look like? In uh, Shenzhen, which is a kind of a city of the future, um, how do they deliver little packages? They do it in a very unusual and very futuristic way. Um, privileged access means we use our, um, our ability to open doors that remain closed if you travel by yourself or if you travel with someone else. We have built relationships over the years. We've never really gone from China. Um, we have had river cruising in China. We have brought Chinese guests to Europe. And uh, so we have teams in Beijing. We have teams in Shanghai. Uh, and they know, of course, who we're, who we're talking to in China. And they, on occasion, can open doors for us that um, normally remain closed. So that is what, where the privileged access comes in. We do this, in this case, um, in, on Putuo Mountain, where we visit a very small private Buddha, Buddhist temple. And we also do it in Gulangyu, um, where we take you into private residence and, and, and introduce you to what life was like in the 19th century. Uh, in that outpost of Western trade missions in, uh, on the Chinese coast. So the types of excursions that we offer, this is, this is helping you to make good choices. Um, in the middle is the activity level. We have an easy level that is accessible to everyone. We have a moderate level where we do need you to be a little bit better on your feet. 
And finally, we have demanding, and that can be not just demanding because it's a long, uh, it's a long excursion where you do a lot of walking. It could also just be um, the conditions in which you walk. I, I'll give you an example. In Tibet, you're high up. Um, it requires a little bit of extra stamina, and it requires a little bit of adjustment to the altitude. So virtually everything that we do in Tibet is demanding, even if it is in and by itself, not a huge amount of physical exercise. And then we try to tell you what the features of an excursion are, um, whether it has a meal included or a snack, whether you can do some shopping. Um, we, we tell you if, if something that we visit is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, as is the Tulo that you see on the uh, on the right hand side of the picture. Uh, that is a circular building. It's it's usually done. Americans like to call this adobe. It's 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 essentially straw clay. And in China, they have these massive round buildings uh, in in a particular region. It's just outside of Xiamen. We take you there, and those are so unique that they're World Heritage sites with UNESCO. Okay. So let me now walk you through the wonders of China one day after another. When you arrive in Beijing, you have two full days there. And we will, of course, visit the Forbidden City. Uh, and that usually tends to be in the morning. But we might want to switch that to the afternoon uh, when we find that it's particularly busy. So you will see all the things that I'm just talking about right now. Uh, but sometimes we will vary the sequence a little bit just to essentially make your journey more enjoyable. Um, outside of the Forbidden City is, of course, Tiananmen Square. You will visit that as well. And then um, the Temple of Heaven is an optional excursion. Uh, we will take you there and you'll have an opportunity to maybe try uh, a little bit of Tai Chi. It is a very popular place with locals. Um, we will also offer you an opportunity to see what life is really like in the older parts of the city by taking you into a hutong. And we have a delightful little video that I would like to show you right now that shows you a little bit of what that is like. And Karina um, moderates this video. She traveled to China quite a few times uh, to introduce the country to you. And here's a little introduction. In the shadow of modern Beijing, nestled among the trees, lies the hidden world of the hutong alleyways. These narrow corridors lead to even narrower pathways in a maze where a lot of life is squeezed into a very small space. Pedicabs were once popular here until forbidden by Chairman Mao. Reinstated in 1999, it's still a great way to get around old Beijing. In the Hutongs, open spaces reveal the sense of community and simplicity. And behind the tall grey walls, an entirely different world, built upon tradition. For a slice of real Chinese life, come inside. This is a Beijing courtyard house, also known as a Si He Huan. Inside is an open courtyard surrounded by buildings. The entrance gate to the Si He Huan is located at the southeast corner. On the north side, the building is meant for the head of the family and receives the most sun. The east building is for the younger generation, the west building for other relatives, while the south building, known as the opposite house, is a family gathering spot or used by the servants. These days, many Siho ones house multiple families, and some have been dramatically renovated into private homes, hotels or museums. The Hutongs and Si He Wans are a fascinating window into China's past. Chairman Mao lived here for a time, as did noted authors, poets, and Sung Ching Ling, the wife of Sun Yat-sen, leader of the 1911 revolution. She graduated from Wesleyan College in the States, and along with her sisters, one of whom was married to Chiang Kai-shek and the other to the nation's wealthiest man, were a powerful trio in shaping China. Sung Ching Ling spent her last years in the Hutongs, and her residence continues as a museum today. Immerse yourself in the soul and spirit of old Beijing as part of a China exploration with Viking. Let us share with you the traditions and culture of ancient China. And the second full day in Beijing is primarily spent to visit the Great Wall. And in the direction of the Great Wall, there is also an area known as the Ming Tombs, 
which is best known for this for this grand uh, road that brings you from one tomb to another that is lined with these phenomenal, beautiful sculpted animals. Uh, so the Ming tombs are in the afternoon. Usually the Beijing wall is in the morning. And then um, we're moving from Beijing. We fly into Shanghai. Okay, so the first three days and nights are spent in a hotel in Beijing. On day four, you travel with us to Shanghai, and that's where you embark Yidun, and that's where the ocean voyage starts. On the day of arrival, and that of course depends a little bit on when exactly you fly, but we'll have some time for a, an initial get to know Shanghai tour where we show you the Bund, of course, and the, the thing that you will find out about the Bund is that you will see a lot of pictures, or you might have seen a lot of pictures about Shanghai already, and, and they look very different. Uh, you know, this, this image that you see here, those are 19th century buildings. There's some very modern skyscrapers in the background, but you're very familiar, I'm sure, with that super ultra modern skyline of Shanghai. And then there are the Yuyun Gardens, and that looks very traditional. And, um, and, and you might even be a little confused as to where you are in China. Shanghai has all of these things. And they're all in a relatively, Shanghai is an enormous city, but they're all in a really, relatively compact area. And we'll show you all of it. Then we leave Shanghai and we have our first day of rest and relaxation. And this is why we give you the picture of our onboard spa. You're now on board your Viking vessel. Uh, and you know what that is like if you've traveled with us before. The ship has every amenity that you will normally find on, uh, on, a, on a Viking ship. And it has a little bit here and there of a, of a Chinese flair. Okay, and so then our first port uh, outside of Shanghai is Zhoushan. And Zhoushan has, has two things. It is a, as I mentioned in the introduction, it is a fishing it's not a fishing village, it's a fairly large city and it is an enormous fleet. This is where a lot of the seafood that is consumed in the markets in China comes from. Uh, it's also a place that has Mount Kutuo and that is one of the four holy mountains in Chinese Buddhism. So it is a great place to see Buddhist architecture to get a sense of how landscape and buildings uh, are, are, are are merged into a harmonious whole. And this is just one of many of the uh, little temples and pagodas you will see. This is the Duo Bao Pagoda on the island. It's a perfect place to wander around a little bit. Um, and then there's one final parting shot of Mount Petuo of the island um, as we then depart and go down the coast. The next place we visit is Dong Tao. And Dong Tao is a very, uh, it's a decent sized island that sits in front of the uh, East China coast. There's a lot of islands along the coast. It's a very rocky shore, most of it. Uh, there are some beaches, but overall it's uh, lots of promontories, lots of rocks sticking out of the water. And um, on the next slide, you will see Wanghai Temple that sits overlooking the, the East China Sea in Dong Tao. The next port that we visit is again an island. It's Pintang Island. And this is a relatively new development of a, of a beach resort, if you will. It has very rocky shores, so rocky in fact that uh, UNESCO has it on the uh, tentative list. Uh, it's so unique in its geology. It also has a little bit of a, um, of a beachy feel, if you will. Uh, the beaches there, and in particular, the winds that blow along the island make it a perfect place for a very modern invention. There's a lot of kite surfing in Pintang. Uh, nearby is Fuzhou, and Fuzhou is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and that's primarily because its old town is so very well preserved. We then move on to Xiamen, and around Xiamen, there are no fewer than three UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Um, you will have a very full day there to explore some of them. You'll have to make some choices, I'm afraid. Uh, and all of them are good choices. So you will, you will always have something great to do. This is 
kind of a, a landmark in Xiamen. You'll see this as you enter the port. This is the statue of Zheng Zhenggong, and he was a, uh, a naval hero of the 17th century. He was also a bit of a pirate, but in the 17th century, uh, those two quite often went hand in hand around the world. Um, Xiamen had, is close to Guangzhou, which is a, a very, very important and a very ancient trading center. Um, and, and it has a lot of, uh, as you can see here, uh, this is a, a, a small private family temple. It has an awful lot of very traditional architecture. Each of these places, by the way, along the coast, and that's important to understand, has architecture that on the surface may look similar, but then when you delve a little deeper, you will find that China has an awful lot, an awful lot of nationalities in this big country. And each of these nationalities has preserved its food, quite often its language, quite often some architectural uh, traditions. And the people that travel with you to explain these cities to you, um, of course, will, will paint really good pictures of what these differences are. They're not always obvious. In some cases, they're quite stunning and quite um, uh, quite easy to see. And this is where uh, the, the Hakka people come in. These are the people that live in these gargantuan roundhouses, the Tulos, that you will find just outside of Xiamen. Um, we will then start to travel again along the coast. And this is just an image of the South China Sea. You can imagine the ship in the distance there. And then we will arrive in Shenzhen, the city of the future. Uh, a city that's grown very rapidly and that has put an awful lot of effort into city planning, into modern ways of, of tackling, uh, you know, problems of growth and, and problems of, of infrastructure. This is a perfect example. One of the great things in Shenzhen is that the companies that are on the leading edge of technology welcome visitors. And so you can see what the future will look like. Um, as people are refining what it is that they do. These little drones actually deliver packages in Shenzhen. Uh, it's easier, it's more cost effective, and it's cleaner than if you have cars driving all over the place. So if your package isn't too big, you can get it delivered with a drone. The architecture is absolutely stunning. Um, the next slide shows you an image of the interior of the Museum of Contemporary Art. This particular museum was designed by an Austrian firm. So Shenzhen has a very, very international skyline. Every uh, major architectural firm that wants to leave a mark in the modern China does so in Shenzhen. The next picture is also a beautiful example. It's the library and the music hall. This is in the evening, of course. So it is really a city that is very pleasing to the eye um, and, and very interesting. Um, to, to, to get a sense of what uh, in, in 10, 15, 20 years, most cities in the world will look like. From Shenzhen, we then um, disembark the ship and that panda seems a little tired, um, but you know, pandas tend to be very low energy animals. They spend a lot of time eating and a lot of time, um, you know, hanging out in trees. This in Chengdu is the, um, the panda base, as it's called. This is not a zoo. This is a place that allows the pandas to live their lives mostly um, uninterrupted by, um, by humans. We're guests there and the pandas live there. So it's pretty much the best place that you can see pandas, except if you were to spend weeks and weeks traveling through the forest to see if you can find the elusive, beautiful bear. We continue to Lhasa, and Lhasa, of course, is the mountain kingdom uh, with the Patala Palace at the top, if you will, of the main street through that city. You can see the Patala Palace from everywhere. Um, we don't just stay with the Patala Palace. We also take you to the Yokhak Temple and through um, a nunnery, a monastery. Um, we take you to the great market in Lhasa. <clears throat> which is where you can buy these, the Barkor market, where you can buy these prayer wheels. Um, the nunnery is on the next slide. 
And here again, this is important to remember. Um, we will fashion. We we have a set. Um, we have a set number of experiences that we want you to have in Lhasa, but we are going to make sure that we do it in a sequence that works well. So if you read in your brochure that you're doing something on day one in the morning, it might be that you do it on day one in the afternoon. Keep that in the back of your head. A little bit of flexibility will make for a great experience. Um, here's a final picture of Lhasa. This is an enormous prayer wheel that sits in one of the temples and then in the background you can see the um the potala palace from here you travel to sian and sian of course became instantly world renowned when um the uh <clears throat> the tomb of the first Qing emperor was found with these hundreds and hundreds of terracotta warriors and we will visit the great pit there's an opportunity even to get a little bit up close to the researches that uh, do ongoing excavations. You will also have an opportunity to see the great city walls. Uh, Xi'an is known for its terracotta warriors, but the city walls are, are quite, uh, quite something. Uh, there's very few cities in China uh, of this size. There's no city of this size that still has the city walls uh, virtually intact. And so you can walk and local people do this. When you go for a walk in Xi'an, People like to do so not in a park, but on the city walls. Because you can walk for, for miles and miles and miles. It's, uh, it's a very unique uh, vantage point over, overlooking the city. And it's a beautiful experience. Finally, then from Xi'an, we finish in Beijing, where on the last day we may uh, be able to bring you to uh, a restaurant that serves arguably the most famous uh, dish in all of China, the Peking duck. And so that concludes the first of the journeys. And now I will explain to you how these relate to the other voyages that we offer. The classic China and the coast is an itinerary that contains the same cruise, but has a, 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 a part, a land part that starts before the cruise that is a little different. You spend the first three days in Beijing. You then travel to Xi'an to see the terracotta warriors and the city walls and the great mosque and possibly enjoy an evening show in, in Xi'an. Uh, then you embark the ship in Shanghai and you end in this case in Shenzhen and you depart China via Hong Kong. And that's what this looks like on a map just to, you know, explain it a little bit more visually. So this is what that journey looks like. Beijing to Hong Kong, uh, classic China and the coast. This journey, because it's a little shorter, allows you to extend if you want. Uh, and this is where I introduce the, uh, the extension packages. So first you have a chance to spend three nights in Hong Kong, and that is a relatively packed program. Uh, the way we do this is you will have an experience, although you're staying in a hotel, you will have an experience that you know from the ship. So we have one included excursion every day, and then we allow you to customize your day, if you will, with optional excursions. And then this is what we do for two full days in Hong Kong. And you'll have some time, of course, upon disembarkation, if this is a post extension package, you will have some time in Hong Kong as you arrive and check into your hotel. So it's a good mix of uh, time at leisure, a meal here and there, and then um, organized and structured time where we bring you to the places we believe are important to visit in Hong Kong. A second option is a four night extension that begins in Hong Kong, but also spends time in Guilin. And I think um, this is the Lee River in Guilin, that image that you see. And I think this is one of those places where I can talk about this for a long time, everything that you see along the Lee River, but this is where an image says more than a thousand words. So I will not say a thousand words. I will just let you enjoy that image. That's what you go to Guilin for. And then um, we, the, the third program that we have, the China Discovery, that goes from Shanghai to Hong Kong. Um, 
and that does the same thing. The ship docks in Shenzhen, and then we will have you fly out of China via Hong Kong uh, to return home. So this is a 10 day journey, nine nights on the ship. And because it is relatively short, of course, we offer you quite a, a variety of, of um, extensions. And we'll delve into those after we look at the map real quick. From Shanghai to Hong Kong, that is the coastal journey. Uh, and then in Beijing, you can add three nights in Beijing, where we have a program that I discussed with you that includes the, the Great Wall, that includes uh, the Forbidden City, where you have the option to visit the Temple of Heaven, to see the Ming tombs. There is a second pre-extension, and that uh, takes you into, if you will, the, the Chinese countryside. It is just outside of Shanghai, this megalopolis, this enormous city um, with this relatively compact urban core. You, can, you don't have to go that far to have a sense that you're in the countryside. And Shuzhou and Wuxi are, are places where you can have this small village sense where there's an awful lot of water. You're in the delta of the Yangtze River, more or less. And so uh, everywhere you look, there are little rivers, there are canals, there are ponds. So a lot of the, the life in these small villages takes place on the water. And it makes for just this really, um, I don't know how to put it, this, this very classic idea that you would have of a small Chinese village where you know a lot of the traffic takes place on the water. Um, this program also allows you to build uh, at the end of your journey. And this is again, three nights in Hong Kong that you can add or four nights where you visit both Hong Kong and Guilin. And again, the style is always the same. It's partially structured, partially included, partially for you to shape, uh, if you will, with any optionals that you could purchase. So there you have it. Three voyages to mark Vikings return to China. In 2024, we only have eight departures, so I hope you book early, and I hope to see you there in China.